in all the great ethical decisions, uh, it's not a question of my own wisdom. That's, I mean, I can be wise, believe it or not. But, but it's got nothing to do with be, how smart or even how wise I am. It, nor did it with John Bathersby. But the, the, the moral compass for me has to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and therefore, my moral identity depends upon a radical attunement to that gospel. And frankly, the key element there I have found over the years is not so much all the high-level studies that I've done, but how I have entered into a life of serious prayer, in other words, listening to the voice of Christ. The danger with any leader comes where he, the only voice he really hears is his own voice. This is absolutely disastrous in the life of a bishop. I, I have to be, before ever I speak or before ever I make a big decision, and inevitably I do have to make some big decisions, I have to make sure that I've listened to other voices. I have to listen increasingly to voices like the people in this room, and I try to do that, just as we're trying to do that with the plenary council. Listen to the voice of the people. But then in all of that, the, the ultimate challenge, I guess, is to listen to the voice of Jesus. But to do that, you've got to believe that Jesus actually communicates with us here and now. I do believe that. And I do believe that there is an art that can be learned of tuning into the voice of Christ. So if you ask me my moral identity as a, as a Catholic bishop or as the leader, it's not to be the fount of wisdom, but to be the one who is most deeply attuned to the voice of Christ and therefore to his gospel and who can make decisions based upon that. Now, this in fact becomes a kind of attention to the church's moral and social teaching, which is entrusted to me as a bishop. And at the heart of that, there is a vision of the dignity of the human person, every human person. So, in terms of moral compass, that, that moral and social teaching of the church, which is born from a listening to the voice of Jesus, is, is the thing upon which I depend totally. That young people today are the product of a radically different uh, religious culture than, than I am, or than Ashley was, is, and even you, Mark, is, is, goes without saying. So you've, we've got to find other ways and words and images that, that touch into their experience. And a lot of what the church has to offer conventionally is just never going to do it for young people, even the best of them. They'll, they'll be seriously uh, interested in questions of social justice. And if you look at those two young guys that set up Orange Sky Laundry, for instance, a great initiative. One of those ones when they did it, you thought, How did, why didn't someone else think of that? It's so obvious. Um, and, and that sort of thing will impress young people. But a lot, a lot of the other religious stuff, they're just not even interested. And I don't know about those young guys who founded Orange Sky Laundry. They probably don't go to Mass on Sunday. I don't know. They might. I hope they do. So it seems to me that, that young people, in their spoken and unspoken critique of the church, may well be calling us to something different. You know, it's often been said with World Youth Day. World Youth Day does do it for a lot of young people. I've seen it. It can be very powerful. But then they come home from World Youth Day all fired up and they go to the local parish and it's a lead balloon. So how do we overcome... This is the question that they're posing. How do we overcome the hiatus between what happens at World Youth Day and what happens in the parish? And I actually think one of the things we're going to have to look at with an eye to the future is a new model of parish. I don't want to rattle anyone's cage or frighten the horses, but I think that's what we're looking at. Um, when I say something new, it, it's also something deeply traditional. And that just by the way, I find myself as Archbishop, all the time I've got to be walking that tightrope, doing two things at the one time. On, on the one hand, imagining the new, but being the guardian of the old. 
I am the voice of times past, and my own studies and formation have trained me to be that. I'm a biblical scholar by training. I know the past. But, but you can't really, as a Christian, imagine the new without the old. So what I'm keen to do is listen to the voice of young people, even if they say things I don't want to hear, but, but help them to, to locate their desires and proposals into the deep story of the church. But that's not, I mean, that's not answering your question very directly, Mark, because it's too big and complex a question. But the young are often the megaphone of the common experience. What the young are saying is often what we're feeling but are not game or able to say. And that's why listening to young people, I think, is, is very important in a time like this. And if you've got any ideas as to how it might happen, and I see some of, there's a lot of educators here, some of them Peter Chapman I see down there, and others, uh, you know, if you've got thoughts and suggestions and ideas, pitch them in. If you're going to wait for bishops and popes to come up with all the bright ideas, you'll be waiting forever. I think if you think too much about legacies, you're probably going to leave nothing. <laughs> uh, look, others are the best judge of this. And legacies, particularly for religious leaders, can be very difficult to assess. When I came to Brisbane, I, di I didn't have any sense of a legacy I wanted to leave. Uh, and if I look back on my six years as Archbishop of Canberra, did I leave a legacy? Yeah, I guess I did, but I don't know what it is. Don't ask me. Others can judge that. And I, as I've been thinking about John Bathersby's legacy, mainly to prepare the homily for Monday, I, I suppose inevitably I've, I've thought, well, my retirement is probably, I don't know, five or six years away, might be more. And what sort of legacy might I let? I don't know. And I, in the end, I don't care. Uh, because in this job, you do have to have a vision of where we're going. But you don't want to be too tied to the vision. You need a, a, a great capacity to take on board the, the power of the provisional in a time of such extraordinary change. So, so um, But then there's another aspect of the job where you just do the next thing. People say to me, oh, how, how do you ever do all the things you do? And basically, you just do the next thing, like you come and have lunch with the ACP. Uh, but, but, so it's not, it can't just, I mean, there was an Archbishop of Canterbury back in the 1940s who, who was asked, you know, what was life as Archbishop of Canterbury like? And, and he said, just one damn thing after the other. And, uh, and another Archbishop of Canterbury, for what it's worth, was asked when he finished, what does an Archbishop need? And he said, well, three things. Uh, the uh, strength of an ox, the height of a rhinoceros, and the memory of an elephant. <laughs> and that's pretty right. So, look, I don't know. If I, can, if I can bed down the plenary council in this nation and in this diocese, uh, I would be mighty well pleased. If I could create a new and joyful future for the Catholic Church in this country, no matter how different it looked, I would again be mighty satisfied. John Bathersby, by the way, was a Queensland classic. I'd never met anything like him when I first met him. Um, and I could say a lot about that. But uh, So he and I are chalk and cheese. I mean, he was the country boy from Queensland, if Stanthorpe is country. Uh, and I was, I'm the quintessential city slicker from down south. And as they say up here, you can tell a Victorian, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> <laughs> but I look, um, why do you feel more at home in some places than others? I've often said to people that I felt more at home in Brisbane after six days than I did after six years in Canberra. I mean, Canberra's a very particular place, of course. But I, there's something I have always found, even before I was Archbishop, deeply congenial, not only about Queensland, but about Queenslanders. 
And I mentioned John Bathersby, who was a great friend of mine from those student days. Michael Putney was another. And I could go on and on. Why did I, in those student days in Rome long ago, find the Queenslanders strangely congenial company? And I have found it since I came here as Archbishop. There's something in the DNA, there's a friendliness, call it that if you wish, in the DNA in this city and in this state that is very unusual, but let's focus on the city. The kind of um, friendliness and the sense of human connection that you find in Brisbane in a big city, you'd never find down south. And some of you know this because you've lived down south or you come from there. Um, but you find it in Brisbane and people down south who say, oh yeah, but Brisbane's a big country town. They don't know Brisbane. Brisbane's a serious city. It's not Sydney or Melbourne, but it doesn't have to be. It's got a sophistication and a, an urban culture that's very distinctive and to me very attractive. Uh, so I describe myself now, Francis, as a, a, an ex-Victorian. <laughs> so, an, or reconstructed <laughs> Victorian. And p- <laughs> people have said to me, when you retire, I guess you go back south. No, I won't. I've got no dreams of the south whatsoever. And uh, I call it the weather, perhaps, or you know, what is it? It's the people you get to know. But that strange thing of where you feel at home, uh, what is home? And see, I, I'm more at home in Rome in some ways than I am in Australia, not in every way, by any means. But why, why in those particular ways do I find Rome to be more home than Australia? I find it hard to say. But some of you, I'm sure, know what I'm talking about. Home is not so much a place as an experience, I think. I certainly remember the visit to, to, uh, to the handicapped. And honestly, I, I wish the constraints of my role uh, didn't make that sort of thing uh, as difficult as it, they do. But look, in the end, before all else, I'm a priest. I was a priest a long time before I was a bishop. Now, the role of bishop is different. And I'm not the parish priest of Brisbane. You can't do it like that. It's a different role. But the danger of the difference is it can, it can reduce, without eliminating, that kind of deeply human contact, particularly with those who may be handicapped or disabled. And this is, again, a point where I think Pope Francis has been just radiant and powerful. Uh, the way he's attended to the homeless and, uh, you know, all kinds of things that we never thought we'd see perhaps in a Pope that he's done um, is also pointing the way to bishops. So that's the other thing I find about Pope Francis, just by the way, is he's, he's modelling a new style of episcopate because when he, when he is with bishops, everything about him, the way he meets us, the way he dresses, the way he speaks, says, I'm one of you. Carries his own bag, uh, even carries his own umbrella when he's going to meet him. You know, simple things like that. And the danger is that the Pope can forget that he's one of his brothers and similarly with a bishop, that the danger is that you can forget that you're one of your brothers. But, but at times the role can constrain you in a way that makes that just a little bit different, difficult. Uh, so I've got to keep reminding myself to refocus and to make sure that I'm a pastor and not just an administrator or some kind of uh, mogul living in the big house in New Farm. Well, thank you for ending us um, on such a lovely note. And would you all join me once more in thanking Archbishop Mark? Thank you.